Okay, welcome to the second episode in uh, Bamberge, the, the series about the, the, the framing of, of Jeremy Bamba. As I said in the, in the previous uh, episode, what I was going to do in this one is talk about the uh, details of what actually happened inside the farmhouse and um, the other narrative that the government doesn't want you to know. Um, before I start, what I want people to do is to have a, a, a basic knowledge of the case. So um, there's a number of ways that you can do that. You can read uh, a number of books that have been written over the years. Um, you can go to uh, the campaign team's website. That is a, a really good place to um, read about the, the evidence that challenges the official narrative of events on that night. Um, but certainly, you know, I've been dealing with the case for 10 years. So when I talk about the case, I, I almost assume that other people understand the story. And a lot of people don't even have a, a, a basic understanding. So if you want to understand the, the things or you want to be able to follow what I'm saying easily and, and quickly, uh, please make sure that you, you educate yourself about the, the broad events of the night, what the, the government's official narrative is. And then you'll potentially be able to understand a lot quicker and a lot easier uh, the narrative or the, the real narrative that I'm going to give you of real events inside the farmhouse. So hopefully you find that very interesting. Um, what I hope to do is obviously, one of the, the key things that's gone wrong in this case is that even Jeremy or, or other people who have looked at the case, they've never really been able to get to the bottom of what actually happened. Now, on Jeremy's website, it does actually outline a broad part, a piece of actually what happened. But there are some bits that were missing. And through the assistance of, of other people, I was able to discover what those pieces were and hopefully um, explain them. It's very, very difficult when obviously I'm not being interviewed here and I'm giving the information to you. So if I'm not very clear about something or I don't explain something very well, you know, my apologies. The only potential solution I can say to that is if maybe there's real things that you want me to go over, then maybe we can set up something with the campaign team that uh, they forward critical emails to me that, you know, if there's something that I don't make really clear. But I'm going to do my best to explain things as best I can. Um, one of the things that I, I will do is I will use uh, soft and hard facts. Uh, what I mean by that is hard facts I'll tell you what happened and the, the, the series of events and decisions that were made. But what I, I want you to try and do is that what I'm going to try and do as well is give you the, the soft facts, the, the reasoning behind why people made certain decisions that they made on the night. It's easy to be very critical. It's easy to say, well, you know, that, that was a stupid thing to do and things like that. But what I want you to try and do is put yourself in the situation of the police in those circumstances and try and try and have a bit of understanding of, of the, the soft situation of, of you know what they were dealing with the equipment and the training and things like that so um, I'll begin with with really the events so obviously uh, if you've read against the case you'll know that uh, the police were called to the farmhouse Jeremy met some police officers at the farmhouse they did a a walk around of the farmhouse and you know you can read the, the various evidence pieces about why then the firearms team was called out and the, the whole incident escalated uh, massively. Well that then basically led to a, a siege situation on the night and the siege situation was with obviously Sheila inside of the house and a large number of armed police officers surrounding the farmhouse. Um, obviously, Jeremy had given the police a list of the, the weapons that were inside the house. He had given an explanation about his sister's um, uh, medical sort of history, explaining that, you know, there were some issues. She was diagnosed as a, a paranoid schizophrenic. She had, uh, had been in hospital and treated for that uh, condition and things like that, and obviously explained things like that. So it was a very large incident um, that took place. And this is one of the first, I suppose, uh, 
things that I want people to understand is really the hopelessness of Essex police in those circumstances. Now, in a modern world, we have a different police force than they did then. Um, we have officers in those circumstances that are issued with body armour. We have officers that are issued with more tactical skills or have more tactical training. So in other words, uh, things like night vision goggles or protective shields or floodlights that could be used in that situation. Um, the officers on that night were issued with uh, pretty much revolvers. They, they didn't have any of the modern day tactical equipment that a modern day police force would have available to them in terms of training. They had no, uh, let's say things like stun grenades or tactical training about how to enter a property, um, you know, as a tactical rating. So really Essex police were in quite a hopeless situation. Sheila was inside the farmhouse and Sheila significantly outgunned the officers and particularly in the, the, the types of weapons that she had available to her. She had uh, probably the two main types, I mean, there were shotguns and, and other weapons inside the house, but the particularly dangerous weapons were two uh, magazine-fed, uh, one semi-automatic weapon and one bolt-action but magazine-fed. These weapons were not the largest calibre, they were a 2-2 calibre, which is a, a relatively small calibre, but they were nonetheless deadly if you were shot in the head from it. And obviously the police officers uh, were not issued with the, the modern style, you know, bulletproof helmets that you see with tactical ratings and, and bulletproof shears. And they also didn't have uh, tactical snipers that they could say, okay, if she starts shooting at us from inside the locked farmhouse, we have at least the ability to shoot back and maybe shoot her in the shoulder or, or, or something like that. So the police were in a very, very difficult position. Now obviously, inside the farmhouse, there were two adults and two children and Sheila. And obviously they had an open phone line from the 999 call that was made. And they were able to listen inside the farmhouse. And obviously they could hear that the children were not crying and that the other adults in the house were not shouting at Sheila or negotiating with Sheila. So the position that that put them in was very, very difficult to know how to actually resolve that situation. Sheila, as I said, was a diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic. I think you can imagine that the sort of circumstances that um, somebody would choose to uh, take their own life and also take other people's lives you know, would be really extreme. So the, the opportunity to negotiate in that situation wasn't there. The opportunity or the skills or the training or the equipment to uh, force an entry safely wasn't there in that situation. So the police were very, very, um, they, were, they were always in a very, very poor position. So as my understanding of what actually happened is uh, they effectively waited for an opportunity. They, they got themselves ready, they got themselves as prepared as they could, they had as many teams available as they felt that they were needed, and they effectively waited uh, for an opportunity. And obviously, you know, without things like night vision goggles, I mean, in a modern raid, you probably would, I don't know, sort of like cut the power, and then you would use night vision goggles to give you a, a superiority in terms of the situation and you would maybe use darkness as your ally. In, in the White House farm situation, they waited till morning. They waited till about, it was around 7.30 in the morning. And as I understand, the trigger for the entry to the farmhouse was seeing Sheila leave a gun upstairs in the box room and then being actually seen downstairs in the kitchen. So with her away from the weapon, an approach was made. Now, it's not very clear. I mean, when things have been revealed, I always have to be a little bit cautious about what I'm being told. And I understand that some people have tried to mislead me. So I understand that when I'm talking, I will say what I understand to have happened. I'll give you my best understanding of what 
events have been described to me and, and things like that. And I appreciate that, you know, some of the detail may not be exactly correct, but I will try and be as accurate as possible. But the key thing is the, the main series of events. So as they approach the farmhouse, Sheila shot herself in the kitchen and the decision to enter the farmhouse quickly was made. Now, this is actually a fairly important point to understand how entry was made. It was actually made with a sledgehammer and they had to knock the back door down and they made a lot of noise. And although it's not known, Sheila was monitored through the kitchen window as this process was happening. It was very noisy and she didn't move from the kitchen floor. And this is when I suppose things started to go wrong because that led the officer to the impression that Sheila was also deceased. Now, as you will be able to read, if you read the, the detail of the evidence, the police actually then entered the back door and they went the wrong way inside the farmhouse. There were three staircases and they went straight ahead and upstairs to the back room. And the back room didn't allow them access into the house because it was a, a back office, it had been painted over. So the police had to come downstairs and then they did something else. They had to push their way into the kitchen and behind the kitchen door was Neville, Jeremy's father, who was deceased. And as they entered that room, they toppled him off his chair. Now that might seem insignificant, but what again that led the officers, you know, Neville didn't groan, Neville was, you know, uh, had rigor mortis, so he was fairly stiff, he was, he had been dead a while. And again, that gave the officers a clear impression of, of what the situation was inside the kitchen. Sheila was still on the floor, Neville was, was, had been pushed off his chair, Neville was also deceased. Now, um, obviously at that point, the priority of the officers, correctly so, was the mother and the two children. They were somewhere else in the house and their physical condition, whether they had been shot whether they were being shot and passing away or what their circumstances were, was the priority. The two people in the kitchen, you know, as you can see in one of the things, you know, one male, one female found on entry to the kitchen, you, you, know, you can read that evidence. They were not the priority. So the officers made the, the correct decision that the other people in the house were the priority and they moved out of the kitchen to find the other people. And obviously they were also deceased. The, the two sons had been shot and also the mother had been shot. And um, if you, you, you read some of the evidence, you, you uh, do find reports of what then happened when the officers returned to the kitchen. And this is really where things took a completely unexpected turn. And that was that Sheila was no longer in the kitchen and she was not actually dead of her initial uh, shot to the neck. And what she'd actually done is taken the back staircase. There's one of the shots of the kitchen. You can actually see the staircase door open. She took that staircase up to recover the weapon that was in the box room. She then stepped through the door from the box room into the parents' room. And where the shots of, of Sheila are taken, that's actually where she committed suicide the second time with the second, the second gun. Um, so there were two guns that Sheila used on herself. What happened then was obviously the officers, there was a fair amount of panic because obviously where was she? What, what were her intentions? Obviously the officers had seen the fact that she had shot herself. So, you know, they understood that a state of mind was um, not something you can negotiate with. They had also seen what she had done to the other people, the other family members. So, you know, there was real chaos for a few seconds. And as you can see in, in some of the police notes, you know, they did call upstairs to Sheila, they did, you know, move upstairs cautiously and things like that. But effectively, when they got to Sheila, she was dead. And she was actually placed in the recovery position. Now, I didn't realize this from the time that I'd looked at pictures. It was only when it was uh, indicated to me that I understood what I was looking at with the pictures. But she was actually rolled over into the recovery position and that did cause the blood to flow off her. And that is, when she was rolled back, um, the Bible was used to cover that and she was cleaned up and things like that, which 
other people have actually noticed by looking at pictures. And you can see from the pictures she is, through the various shots, she is in actually different positions. So you can see that the, the officers did actually um, move Sheila's position. The problem that the officers had, and this is where it begins to, I suppose, uh, I wouldn't say really go wrong, but the main concern at that time was not really uh, the mistake that they had made, but it was really a combination, from what I understand, of, of protecting Jeremy, so the decision was made partly to look after Jeremy, and, from what I understand, to partly protect the mistakes that they had made or cover up the mistakes was really what what do they tell people so the officers said well you know this is the situation she has shot a family and she's committed suicide that's what's happened and that was what was obviously told to jeremy and that is a hundred percent true of what happened inside the farmhouse the only difference is is obviously the additional story that she attempted suicide once downstairs and then a successful second time upstairs after the officers didn't actually check for a pulse as they stepped over her in the kitchen. That was the mistake they made. And again, this is one of those examples where I'm going to give you soft facts. You might think, well, that was stupid. But obviously, uh, the incident was quite shocking to officers. Their priority was the people upstairs. And Sheila was in a nightdress. She wasn't wearing any underwear. Neville was also in his pyjamas, which had fallen down on his knees. You know, have a bit of understanding to the, the soft situation that maybe the officers weren't overly keen to get to check the bodies. It was, you know, you know, they'd made a lot of noise at entry. They had made a lot of commotion when they pushed into there. Neither people had moved. So it was an easy mistake to make that, to assume that they were deceased. And they, they made that simple mistake which is understandable it's not an incident that you are presented with a lot in your career even if you're a, a trained firearm officer so what actually happened then and this is really where um, a better understanding of, of why jeremy was framed or where it really starts to go wrong the officers were faced with the problem of sheila had two gunshot wounds uh, to the head as suicide wounds now the officers said, well, you know, the decision was, well, how do you shoot yourself twice in the head to commit suicide? Obviously, you know, that they were worried about saying, well, is people, are people not going to ask questions about this? So what actually happened is the decision was made amongst those officers to swap the gun over. From the gun that Sheila had shot herself with, which was a 2-2 bolt action gun with a silencer fitted to it, you know, to a semi-automatic gun, okay, without a silencer fitted to it. So I'm going to be quite specific there about what guns were swapped and why they were swapped. Now, obviously, I hope people have a bit of understanding about weapons, so I'll, I'll give a bit of an explanation there. A semi-automatic weapon is, is, you know, you know a machine gun when you pull the trigger... You know, the gun empties itself from the magazine, you know, until you release the trigger. Semi-automatic does something similar, but it, it only shoots one shot at a time. And it's possible for that mechanism to, to fail in some way or, or misoperate. And sometimes you get more than one shot in quick succession. There is a, a term for it. So the officer said, well, with a, a weapon that's a semi-automatic, if we say that's the weapon that Sheila shot herself with, then that explains how she shot herself twice in the head. So that was the reasoning of the officer's decision to swap the guns over. Now that might seem like a sensible and reasonable decision, and it, it probably was at the time. The great problem, and this is where really things, I suppose, start to go wrong, or really things happen, is all the weapons in the house were not owned by the family that were now deceased. The weapon that they swapped off Sheila that had, which was obviously emptied at the time, and uh, magazines had been used that had preloaded weapon bullets in them, um, that actually belonged to a member outside of the family. So 
when the family came back to the farmhouse to recover things, and obviously the, you know, their own gun, it was very, very easy to see that the gun had blood on it, and it was empty, and it had been fired. So by swapping the guns over, the police officers created an additional problem that they couldn't have foreseen at that moment that they made the decision. And that was that the family were going to know that the one gun or the, the automatic, the semi-automatic weapon was the weapon that had been used in, in all of the um, shootings inside the house. So the decision to swap the guns was really critical in, in the decisions within the farmhouse which caused problems. Um, so the officers made that decision and that's why there were delays in getting the, uh, clearing the house, making the house safe for other officers to go in. What actually happened, and this is um, uh, recorded in, in some of the other paperwork, is the officers actually made a decision to run a training exercise. And the, the reasons for this training exercise is, is not really fully understood by most people and, and other people. People know that it took place. And some of the people have found out that you know, the reason for the exercise was to practice taking a gun off and off, on and off somebody, which seems a bit odd. The real reason for the training exercise was really um, to try and avoid the circumstances that had put the officers at risk. <clears throat> Obviously, them not noticing that one of the individuals was still alive had a twofold risk. It put them in danger because obviously Sheila could have shot other officers before she shot herself, um, was capable of that and had the weapons to do that. Um, but also stop the officers potentially saving anybody. So firearms teams, what they decided to do was run a training exercise and say, okay, you know, we, we don't want to advertise this, but this opportunity and this mistake is pretty critical. We're going to call in other farmers officers and we're going to walk them around a real scene, which was, you know, obviously there were five dead people inside the farmhouse and actually, you know, take that opportunity to do a, a training exercise. And obviously that, that training exercise wasn't fully documented. That's not something that was ever asked from Jeremy. But Jeremy, as I understand, is aware that um, certain pictures were, were taken and there are documents of a training exercise being run and there were records of, of people who were entering the farmhouse that were stopped at certain stages to, to cover up the fact that a training uh, situation was made. So that's actually what happened inside the farmhouse. And <clears throat> um, obviously that might conflict with some of the other stories that you've been told. Um, I, I did read on the uh, Jerry Mamba website, there was an explanation about uh, how maybe the gun mistakenly went off in an upstairs bedroom. Um, obviously, people are trying to piece together the information that they've got. And I do know where that story's come from. It's come from a, a guy called Mike, and he's done an excellent job over the years of, of looking at the evidence and trying to pull out the truth. And people get very, very close to the truth. They, they find out the details of a training exercise, but they don't specifically know why it was called. But what actually happened was, was that. So the weapons that Sheila used was an air rifle in the kitchen. She went back upstairs and she shot herself with the bolt action uh, magazine fed weapon. And the weapon that was swapped over was the uh, semi-automatic weapon, which was the the reason that was done is the explanation of how she shot herself twice in the head and was able to do that, you know. Uh, obviously the weapon, um, as I understand it, I've not had a, a, an exact explanation. What I understand is, is the extra weapon that she did shoot herself on, the really long one, um, the silencer was then put away in the cupboard and this is where I think the blood was left on the silencer and the gun was put away into another room but not the correct room that it was normally stored in and obviously um, the magazines that were reloaded into that weapon were also empty so it was very easy for the family. So 
this, I think, is, is a bit of an explanation of uh, then five weeks later why the case then took a twist that it did. Because as, as some of you will be aware, the case was initially that Sheila had committed suicide before she had done that, shot her, shot her kids and her family. That was the official narrative. Why did Essex police suddenly change their direction? Well, as I understand, the, the, the critical moment was five weeks later when the, the family effectively pressurised Essex police to have a meeting with um, ACC Peter Simpson, which is the Assistant Chief Constable Peter Simpson, in his office. And although that was a private meeting, what I understand to have happened in that meeting was the family effectively said, look, we know what you're telling us is not the truth because we know that Anthony's weapon has been used. We can be absolutely sure, you know, the way he stores it, the ammunition in the magazines, you know, how many, you know, the smell of the gun. We know what you're telling us is cannot be true. And obviously we want you to tell us the truth. We want you to find out the truth. And obviously there were certain uh, issues within the family and what the family was doing was correct. They, they knew what they were being told couldn't be correct, and they were pushing the police for an explanation. And effectively, the lever, because obviously they had expressed this to other people, and the press were beginning to, to, to smell more of a story here, and that caused Essex police to change the direction of the investigation. And this is where it becomes a little bit harder to understand the soft facts and... and who knew what when, but as I understand it, the decision to then look at Jeremy was done to try and deflect interest or attention and criticism away from Essex Police. At that stage, the decision to frame him wasn't actually made, but the action of reinvestigating events didn't have the effect of appeasing the family or, or, or making the attention go away. It actually had the opposite effect. So what actually happened is the press became more interested, saying, hang on a minute, you know, you're now interviewing you know, the son. You know, is there something you should be telling us? And actually, it drew more attention to Essex Police. And obviously, with more attention, more criticism, and with more criticism... Um, the very thing that they were trying to avoid when they made their decisions to swap the weapons over. You know, if somebody realises that, you know, we made a mistake here, we could be criticised, let's swap the guns over, that gives an explanation to what happened, you know, a narrative. And this was now beginning to spin out of control. So effectively, the, the, you know, the rest is almost history, you know, by what circumstances they got to a trial, as I understand, they didn't actually expect to get a conviction of Jeremy. There was no evidence, there was no real motive, there were no witnesses, there was no forensics. They, they didn't expect that you know, Jeremy would be convicted, although there was one officer that, that worked very hard and very creatively um, in terms of witness statements. And the end result was a conviction now, of course, um, that places Essex Police in, in a very, very difficult position because, um, you know, once you get a conviction, then it's, it's very, very difficult to roll that back. And obviously, you know, you always have to remember that, you know, in those days, you know, like in Hillsborough, there were lots of notes making. So... You know, this kind of explains why, you know, you've never seen the original handwritten notes. Uh, the firearms team were never called to the trial, um, you know, to give evidence and things like that. As I understand, there were lots of people that, that said, you know, don't call me. And, you know, there's other things. So hopefully what I've done there is I've given you the outline of events inside the farmhouse. And hopefully I've given you...